and I'm going to be showing you some from the past. One of the things I've been involved with uh, my fly tying career is setting up fly tying theaters and been involved with the many conclaves that fly fishing groups and clubs have over the country. And they uh, really highlight tires that you may not have ever met. And one of the best ones is ones in Idaho, both the Western Idaho Expo and the uh, Eastern Idaho Expo, which is in Idaho Falls. Uh, they've been doing these fly tying get together for a long time. We're talking over 30 years. So I want to do some highlights from some that I filmed in 2009 and 2010. And you will get a chance to meet some names you know, and some, maybe some names you didn't know. And one of the nice things about tying at these expos is all the uh, excitement and sounds of people going around telling lots and lots of fly fishing stories. Most of them may be exaggerated. But one of the nice things about the theater is you get a chance to listen to the tires talk about it, their experiences uh, and, and answer questions. I, I think you're going to enjoy them. Uh, we're going to start this uh, week with uh, uh, several. Uh, we'll try to give you the most information. And I know some of you are going to say, wow, you know, I don't know about the materials. Well, these are really uncut. So, you know, you do your best on figuring it out. But I think you're going to enjoy the interaction uh, with the crowd and with the tires. And really, uncut un and, I think, extremely fun. Let's get going. And the next, the next fly I'm going to do uh, is a humpy dry fly. The next fly I'm going to do... Uh, is a humpy dry fly. This is a fly Bruce Staples has been trying to talk my wife into coming over here and demonstrating for probably six or eight years. And since she's now kind of quit tying flies, it's just not going to happen. So I'm going to do it. And uh, she said, she gave me permission. Uh, it was one of my wife's favorite flies and one of the things that uh, she became very well known for tying. Uh, used to be an extremely popular fly when we were commercially tying flies in the Jackson area uh, in the 70s and early 80s. And uh, I believe one, one winter she did, if you can imagine this, 60 dozen size 12 yellow humpies. It didn't include any of the other sizes, any of the other colors that we did, just 60 dozen size 12 yellow ones, which was the most popular of the flies. Um, to make these, and one of the tough parts about a humpy fly, dry fly, is getting the proportions to come out even and so that whether you're tying a size 4 for Atlantic salmon or you're tying a size 18 for a fussy trout, the proportions will come out the same as long as you follow uh, the proportions that were, were designed back, that we, we worked on designing back in the uh, 70s. Uh, the first and critical aspect is the tail. The tail is, I've come to like using uh, elk leg or elk hock, uh, a dark brown, stiff material. It blends in very nicely. It can be a uh, part of a beetle, part of a stone fly, part of a, you can also grasshopper part, or a caddis, beetle, whatever the, uh, the fish thinks it may be. It's kind of a nondescript fly, but it in some regards, it's not really a, a tractor fly. A tractor flies, to me, are something that does not represent anything necessarily, and the trout take it for some reason that we may not ever understand. Um, a humpy is not an attractor. It's a searching fly. It is, represents a lot of things. But using the, the stiff elk ho hair, elk hock, elk hair tail. Um, and this is the, the most critical aspect of this fly so that uh, if we get the proportion and measurements of this part right then the rest of the fly falls right into place. Um, the tail needs to extend off the back of the hook a same length as the hook shank. Now I've marked my scissors with marks and these relate to dry fly 
hook shank lengths so that I can measure proportions of dry flies. Uh, <clears throat> the, tie, the tail is tied in at the halfway point of the hook shank, not forwards, and this becomes our measuring elements for the rest of the fly. The tail is the correct length, one hook shank length. In this case, it was a little bit long, so I'm going to snip that off. If the tail's too long, uh, then the whole fly is out of proportion. So we'll take the time to re reset the tail again in the middle of the hook to the end of the curve. And in this case, I'm using a standard uh, shank length dry fly hook and set the tail. Now the tail is the correct length as by measurement. We'll now measure. Use deer hair for the body. You can also use elk hair, but in this case we'll use deer hair. Uh, the humpy flies can be tied in a whole variety of colors. Uh, yellow, red, black, fluorescent green, uh, any variety of, of colors. Orange, you name it, you can do that, that kind of a color. And, uh, but but back, to, back to the humpy representing something. Uh, does a very nice job of representing a small stone fly. Um, in the Jackson area, we used them in fluorescent green. It represents a bright green small stone fly that we have very common on lots of our small streams. Uh, yellow, we have lots of beetles with yellow bodies. Black, it can be a beetle with black body. Never been quite sure about red, but red is also another common color. So, for our deer hair, we'll take a clump of deer hair, put it in the stacker, and its correct measurement is from the end of the hook of the tail to the eye of the hook. And we can hold it right here and snip it off right at the eye of the hook, right in front of the eye of the hook. If I make that measurement, now the body will come out, and my tail measure, my tail proportion was correct, and now the body proportion will be correct. Uh, the key of the body, and this takes a practice with using the, clump, the size of hair clump that you want to select, whether you want a kind of a fat body, bodied humpy or a thin bodied one, but the correct way here is to tie this down right in the middle of the hook, right where that tail started. Now, take the patience to or pull this. The deer hair would like to wrap around this hook. And so we intentionally pull this up from the hook shank as I wind back. Wrap it forwards and coat the body with come it all the way back. Make sure that that clump of deer hair is pulled up from the hook shank so that it doesn't wrap around. Fill in that body portion. And now that I've gotten it all filled in, nice and smooth, we'll come to the front. Now we'll, now we'll start to pull that deer hair forwards. We'll pull it, put some tension on it, pull it forwards, get a good grip on it, make sure we've gotten all the kinks out of it. If I've got a little too much deer hair, I can take them out. I don't have to take the whole fly. I can make a snip or two from the underside of this body, right here where I'm snipping, if I decide I have a little too much deer hair, I can reduce the size, the amount of deer hair without having to take the whole fly apart. It's a nice little handy, handy tip that you can uh, use. Now we'll bring that forwards. Now again, the deer hair would like to come around that hook and be under the hook. So again, intentionally pull after the first wrap, right at the front of the body, we'll pull that deer hair up so that it pulls, it's tightened on top of the hook shank. And we'll make three or four wraps behind the wing and then wrap in front. Now we can leave the wing like this in one solid clump, some of the early humpies were, or I prefer to divide them. And I like to keep the wings so they stand up and stay straight instead of wanting to lean forwards over the eye of the hook. And now to do that best, we'll wrap around the base of each of these wings. Kind of like you would on the wolf on the wing of a of one of the wolf type patterns as well, and that will make keep make sure that these wings stay up and stand up straight and tall uh, while we fish that fly. 
Now, there, there's the proportions on the humpy. And if I do that tail right the first time, follow the body length, as I pointed out, the wings will come out just right. Now, in most of the heavily hackled flies, like a humpy and a wolf, that are designed to float very well, to float in heavy current if, if necessary, uh, we generally overhackle these just a little bit. So instead of following the proportions you would on an Adams and make the hackle one and a half gaps of the hook, sh of the hook we'll stretch this out a little bit, and on these heavily hackled flies like this, we'll have this be two gaps of the hook, of the hook gap. That will give us some additional flotation, <coughs> make this fly a good floater on rough water. Broken water, riffles, any variety of places. Take two feathers, we'll tie them down, and I like to use saddle hackle. Uh, we'll use a grizzly and a brown. You can use any combination of that that you'd like. Um, make the hackle stems long. Um, and what I'd like to do is get as much hackle in here as I can. So we'll wrap with two feathers. Try to get three wraps of hackle behind the wing. There's two, three whole wraps of hackle behind the wing. And the feathers, saddle hackle feathers are long enough. We don't need to use uh, hackle pliers. One of the reasons I like to use saddle hackles, but I'm running out of room, so we'll use the, sad, we'll use the hackle pliers. Finish that off with five wraps. And that leaves enough room for the hair, the head. So I have five wraps of hackle of two feathers. That's ten wraps of hackle on this size 12 humpy dry fly. Now that will float in just almost any kind of water, rough water conditions. Uh, but it's also the kind of fly that, even though it's pretty bushy, it doesn't, it'll fish in, in quieter water as well. And Another thing that a humpy has been used for for a lot of years has been uh, as a mayfly emerger, particularly in smaller sizes. So you get the hump on the back that looks like those emerging wings, you get the coloration on it, and uh, it makes a very good emerger for small mayflies, or even large mayflies. So it, it can work uh, for a variety of, imitate a variety of uh, insects, caddisflies, stoneflies, beetles emerging mayflies. Uh, it's a kind of an all-purpose fly and in recent years because of foam and other interests it's kind of been uh, been overlooked I think and, and the humpy isn't as used in, in as many fly boxes as it used to. It's still a fly that will catch fish anywhere whether it's New Zealand, here, just absolutely any place that you might you might want to take it. Part of the the humpy dry fly pattern, we started using them here in our area in fluorescent green. One of my, as this one is, and uh, one of my clients from Texas started taking them to, uh, to New Zealand to fish during the February uh, uh, Manuka beetle hatch. And uh, it was so popular down there for that particular uh, insect, that beetle occurrence in February that I actually started having New Zealand guides uh, ordering flies from me for several years before they started uh, reproducing them down there or in other places. But it's a, an extremely good fly in any of a variety of colors, whether it's uh, fluorescent green or yellows, reds, peacock colored. Uh, one of Jack Dennis's variations is a royal humpy, and you can actually do this with, with instead of deer hair wings, with uh, uh, calf tail wings. But you can also make the body as per a royal wolf with two sections of peacock and the red center. Makes it very much look like a, uh, a flying ant and uh, can be a very effective fly for that in that.